First slide, Matthew 6, 25 through 34 is our passage today. So open your Bibles and I'll read it. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray as we talk about anxiousness from the Sermon on the Mount. Father God, as we launch into just thinking through and meditating on this passage, Lord, I just ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts, we would, that we would see the reasonableness of Jesus' words, that we would have healthy eyes, and that, Lord, that we would operate as if we know who you are and are joyfully submitting to you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said... Okay, so first, the first slide then is this. Therefore, I tell you, therefore, I tell you, not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Therefore, see how I highlighted that for you? Therefore, how many people have heard this passage before? It's pretty popular. It's amazing to me, at least in my experience, how often we hear this passage disconnected from the passage right before it. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Well, based upon your choices in the, first, in the five verses right before this, your choice to, to, to lay up your treasures in heaven rather than on earth, your choice to see clearly and perceive how reasonable it is to lay up treasures in heaven and how uh, unreasonable it is to lay up treasures here on earth. You would have a, a healthy eye to see that. Based upon your choice to serve no one or anything other than Yahweh God himself, not, not wealth, but God alone, based upon that, therefore... I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. He says, I'm going now to explain to you how this, this choices, this healthy-eyed view of what's right and what's wrong, and what's, what's, worth, what's worthy and what's not worthy, how this plays itself out in practical life. And his statement for saying how it plays out in practical life is, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. This is a sermon from Jesus about not being anxious. Now, I just want to slow down right now and just acknowledge that we will, that I know that in this room there will be a couple of responses, potential responses. And the first one is me see, Jesus says right there, we should never be anxious. And so when you're anxious, you are lesser. I'm better than you because I don't get anxious. It's kind of that idea. And then there's going to be another response, equally as bad, 
Then it's like, oh no, I'm an anxious person and this is going to make me more anxious. And so I need to get into my safe place so that I don't get anxious about being anxious. You guys are kind of giggling, but that's true. This is where we go. It's, it's, it's my prayer all week that I would not offend anybody with the truth of what Jesus is saying here, but that it would simply be clear. Jesus says, look, if you have, if you, you healthy-eyed people who can see it clearly and perceive what's reasonable and what's not reasonable, I'm telling you, if you choose to serve Yahweh instead of wealth, then you won't be anxious. And that's actually a good thing. And what he's saying here, let me, let me just back up. I want to make sure, just, just because I'm, I, I want you to know that uh, I'm preaching to me today. I am a person who is prone to anxiety. Like anxiety attacks. Like in your throat where you feel like you're going to throw up attacks. Like can't sleep at night attacks. I'm an anxious person, and I'm prone to those kinds of attacks. And so I know, I know what I'm talking about as far as being a recipient and being an experiencer of this anxiety. But I'm going to tell you, the, the answer, the hope, the joy for me is not to say, well, I'm never going to be anxious again. I'm a man, for crying out loud. I'm a pastor, for crying out loud. I can't be anxious because you know what? That's not real. And I can't also, I can't also give myself a pass as if this anxiousness is happening to me. And I'm a victim to my anxiousness. There's no hope in that. And so what I hope to, to show you is what Jesus is showing us is that there's hope in seeing anxiousness for what it is. And this is what it is. Now think about your anxiety. So, so hopefully you're, you're like relaxed now and you can start thinking through it. Here's what anxiety is, what anxiousness is. It's being focused on the wrong thing. It's having your thoughts focused on the wrong thing. It's the opposite of being pure in heart. Do you remember that from the Beatitudes? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does that mean to be pure in heart? That they would see clearly, they would be healthy-eyed, and that they would be laser-focused on God. They will see God. And so when I'm anxious, I'm not focused, I'm not laser-focused on God. I'm, in fact, divided. I'm separated. And I'm distracted. It's what Scripture calls double-minded. That's what my anxiety is. James says it this way in, four, in chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That sounds good. Then he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. An anxious mind is a mind that is in several divisions. It's broken apart. This is how Jesus describes Martha. You guys remember the story of Mary and Martha? Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Let me read it. And notice how, in the context of this discussion on anxiety, and how he points to Martha, so you're anxious, but look at how he paints the picture of what this anxiousness looks like. He says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Mary had laser focus on Yahweh. James, earlier in his letter, he says this. He says, 
this person is a double-minded person, a double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. Martha, you're doing all of these good things, but you're double-minded, and that makes you unstable. You're anxious. So this is the picture of anxious. This is the picture that Jesus paints of anxious. And I just want to make this note here. This is not an indictment. It's a status. It's the way that it is. The reason that that's important and I wanted to slow down and just say that is because the whole implication here, the whole expectation here is that you can change. You don't have to be anxious. I don't have to get up in front of you and say I'm prone to anxiety and so that's just going to mar me for the rest of my life. No, I'm, going to, I'm prone to anxiety. I'm going to put it in the right category. I'm going to put it in Jesus' category that I'm a double-minded man so now I know what I to do. I actually can do something and I can choose not to be anxious. This is hugely important. This, this matters I'm going to kind of scratch the surface on, on this, but just think, think through the importance of seeing anxiety and anxiousness the way that Jesus paints it here. This whole Prop 139 that we've been talking about that expands the this, this scope of abortion in, in Arizona and all those things. Well, one of the, 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 one of the talking points on the pro side of that is that it takes away... It takes away the need for a medical professional to be involved. And what it allows then is for anybody, like a, like a counselor or a therapist, to label a woman too anxious to have a child as a reason for abortion. And I get it. I get it. If, if anxiety is not something that I can change, it's not something that the gospel trumps, then I have to go down those paths of protection. But that's how awry the reasoning gets. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying this, and in light of you having a healthy-eyed perception of God, you can change. And ladies and gentlemen, that is good news. That's gospel. And we have to cling to that. So Jesus, now picture this. So here's Jesus, right? He's, he's preaching to the disciples on the side of the mountain, the Sermon on the Mount. And he's just got done saying, like, you need to choose who your treasure is. And as you choose what your treasure is, and you're going to serve Yahweh. You're going to serve God. You're not going to serve wealth and mammon. You're going to do all things. He says, I see you want to do that. Good for you. But take the next step. Jesus says, take the next step and don't worry. Now think about that. He's telling them, it's not going to do. If you abandon seeking things, the treasures of this earth, if you abandon security here on earth, and you continue, though, to be in a frenzy, anxious confusion, that just doesn't make sense. So pick a team. Pick a treasure. Pick a God to serve. Don't be torn don't be divided. Don't be fragmented. Don't be anxious, but rest. Be at peace. Jesus isn't being harsh here. He's just being clear. Now, this is what I love about this. We're, we're just, we're, we're, we're going to go to the next one. We're going to go to the, the next, no, then right before that. Oh, that that's it. That's, it. That's, it. that's the one I want argument. He's not saying like, go be anxious. Stop it. No, no, no. He's saying, he's saying, because of all of these things, don't be anxious. Let me explain to you. Let me explain something. And he gives us five arguments. Did you see them in there when we read them? Five arguments. 
How much more argument? Fat birds argument? That's my favorite one. You're not in control argument? Well-dressed flowers argument? New affection argument? He's going to give us five arguments. And what I want you to see as we go through these, step through these arguments, I want, to, I want you to sh- see how all of these arguments have a structure to them, but they are, they are they're reminding us and the disciples of God's sovereignty and his greatness and God's love and his goodness. Just look for that in there as we go through there. So these five arguments, let's, let's take a look at the first one. Argument one. The how much more argument. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Here's the argument. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Here's the argument. How much more? God made your life. God made your body. You didn't. We don't make our life and our body. We can't make it. We can't keep it. But he can and he does. So our life, for which he's responsible, is more important than the food and drink that nourish it. This is what Jesus is arguing. And just like that, our body, for which he is responsible, is more important than the clothing which covers and warms it. So here's the argument. So then, if God, who wanted you to have a life and a body, has already given it to you, then it makes sense that he can can and he will handle your food and your clothing to nourish it and keep it warm. If he's already done the hard stuff, he certainly can do the easy stuff. And he will do the easy stuff. What he's not saying here is this. He's not saying that life consists of more than food, so don't worry about food. After all, life surely is more than mere food. So if you don't have food, quit being a sissy. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, if God can handle the really tough part, then he can and he will handle the easy part. Isn't your life harder for God to provide? If God can provide you, then he can provide you food. That's his argument. How much more? This is important. Because I think we are very prone to forget this reality. We are prone to forget this gospel truth. This gospel truth right here, this argument that he's making right here, I think should be immensely convicting and convincing to us as believers. Because as believers who believe the gospel, we believe that man does not create himself. And as believers, we should act like we believe it. Let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 139. Just have your thumb on there. I'm going to refer to it. Psalm 139, 13. If you've been around church very long at all, you've heard these words. Psalm 139, 13 says this. This is the psalmist. Speaking to God, for you, God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together, where? In my mother's womb. Who did that? You, God. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. No one has ever decided to come into this world and exist. It's God's choice. It's not my choice. It's not your choice. It's not my mom's choice. See, right here, Jesus is saying life is the gift. And this gift is the will of God. I just got done teaching you how to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Well, here it is. And if we believe that we are God's will, 
that we are his gift, then why would we think he is now suddenly going to deny himself and his power and not see to it that life is sustained and enabled to continue? Don't be anxious. Stop worrying. If we believe that he started it by the decree of his divine will, then the question's settled once and for all, is it not? Do we need to be reminded of that? Over and over and over. So he says, focus on this. Life is not yours. Life is his. That's the first argument. Much more. So much more. All right, let's go to the, the second argument. We're gonna, I'm going to take the, the fat birds and the well-dressed flowers together. Because now he's going to talk about, like, if I take care of these, so it's lesser to greater argument. But let's look at verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. Look, he says. All right, so he, he's, he's saying, take a gander, you healthy-eyed people, and reason this out. Look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now Jesus turns to this non-human world. And he's arguing as we look at the birds. Later we're going to consider the flowers, the lilies. Birds. Twitter about. Super busy. Right? But they're not anxious. They're not worried. They're just doing their thing. Humans. Now, with all the reasoning as an image bearer of God, all we do is get busy and worry about where our next meal's coming from. Oh, if I could just have the brain of a bird. I had to keep that in there. You know that, right? I mean, really, that's, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> I know what you guys are. You do. <laughs> Stop it. Right? I mean, seriously, I mean, like, look at them, but they're just doing their thing. And guess what? Every day they get fed and they're not even worried about it. Jesus says this. He says, use your brain power and think. Are you not more worthy? Aren't you more, are, are, don't you have more worth than those birds? He says, consider the lilies, verse 28. So let's skip over 27. I'm come back to 27. So I'm doing, I'm doing argument two and not argument four. We'll come back to number three, just because I like to complicate it. But same, same kind of argument. Consider the lilies. And why are you anxious? This is verse 28. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? They don't toil. Consider those lilies. They don't toil. They don't spin. But somehow, they're more beautiful than Solomon. That's, a, that's saying something to this Jewish audience. He was the pinnacle of wealth and beauty and wisdom. There's a guy named G. Campbell Morgan. And I'm just going to read what he wrote about this because I couldn't improve it. He says, take that flower. Take that holen lily, gorgeous and beautiful in its coloring. And put it by the side of Solomon in his magnificence, in his robes of gold and silver and jewels and splendor. The lily is more beautifully clothed than Solomon. Take the finest fabric the monarch ever wore and submit it to microscopic examination and it's sackcloth. Take the lily and submit its garments of delicate velvet to microscopic examination and investigation. And the more perfect your lens, the more exquisite the weaving of the robe of the lily will be seen to be. Christ is not indulging in hyperbole, he says. He's stating a cold fact. 
No garment loomed to the finest and softest texture as anything but rough sackcloth when placed by the side of the drapery with which he has clothed the lily. Christ is saying this, open your eyes and look at the lilies lying scattered over the valleys and mountains growing among thorns and know that when God makes the lily, kings desire and cannot obtain such a robing. Looking at that flower and seeing all its decking, know this, he who clothes the lilies will clothe you too. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the lilies in such a magnificent way. It's a shocking way. And if he's going to take care of those, how much more will he take care of you? Do you see him reasoning this out? If you have a healthy eye to see this and reason it out, then you will see how this plays out And keep me from being anxious. Let's go to the third argument that we skipped. Argument three. You're not in control. Have we heard this before already today? Do we know this in our mind, but maybe not believe it in our heart? You're not in control, he argues. So right in between the fat birds and the well-dressed lilies, he puts this in. He says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If you think about it and see it for what it says, it really becomes the ultimate mouth closer, doesn't it? It's the mouth closer, but at the same time, it's tender. It's comforting. God's in control, not me. Now, here's what I think is interesting. The the world knows this. This is what all the, like, Andrea was telling me that she she had some coaching. And she was just talking about how she, she, you know, she gets a little bit uh, anxious about a meeting. And her coach, you know what her coach non-believing, secular, in-the-business-place coach says this. says, well, don't spend your energy on things that don't matter. Don't be thinking about what can go wrong in your meeting, right? Don't be anxious about those things because it just doesn't make sense. And then she was coached this way. And so when you take your energy away from what you're worried about, put your energy into things in the future that will actually help you. That sound good? Yeah, pay that woman. Pay that coach. That's good stuff. We know that. I love the Cardinals. I can't wait for them to beat Detroit today. (laughs) I, I can't, but, you know, and, and you know what I love? I love listening to the coach. And he's like, he, says, he just says stuff like, he's like, be where your feet are. What's he saying? You can't be, you, like, if, if you're not where your feet are, where do, you can't affect anything. And so we, but we don't listen to that, right? We, we look at what might happen in the future, and we worry about it today. And then if it happens, we've double worried And if it doesn't happen, we've worried when we didn't need to. It just doesn't make sense. Now, what's interesting about the way Jesus puts this, he says, he says, and which of you, by being anxious, like this is the fuel, can add a single hour to his span of life? That could also be to the length of your life. Single cubit, some translations say. It can be translated both ways. And the whole point here is, do you really think that you've got a good strategy that says if I'm anxious, I can actually prolong my life? I can add to my life? Well, clearly the answer is no. Like with a healthy eye, we like, well, that's not just kind of dumb. Why? Because we believe that God is sovereign and in control, don't we? Go back to Psalm 139, verse 16 this time. 
Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. So here's the psalmist speaking to God again. Your eyes, Lord, saw my unformed substance unformed substance in your book were written every one of them what the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them in other words God is in control of my days every one of them before I'm even formed and why is Jesus bringing up this argument in this way He's just being clear. He's drawn the line. He says, he's basically confronting us. As regards to my life, as regards to the number of days which are written in his book, I am not included in the decision. That's how clear Jesus wants to be. Who is included? God himself. That means that no amount of agitation, no objection, no frustration, no unrest on my part will change the decision which God's already made, saying, when as yet he saw my unformed substance in my mother's womb. He's already made the decision. He's basically saying, quit acting like you have it. So what would a healthy-eyed person choose? Not frustration, not anxiety, and not worry. But a healthy-eyed person would choose satisfaction and comfort and reassurance. Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? That brings us to our last argument, verse 32 and 33. It's the argument of a new affection. The argument of a new affection. Let's read. For the Gentiles, verse 32, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We've seen this before in his sermon, where he's basically saying, If you're a believer, now watch me be all smart here. If you're a believer, you're not an unbeliever. You're different. You have new affections. Be different. Be countercultural. Be countercultural, not in the sense of like, get a sword and go storm in the Capitol. Be countercultural. In the sense that you believe that the Father already knows what you need. And maybe if you believe that, not just in your head, but in your heart, you will act like you believe it. That's what makes you different. That's what makes you different from the world that does not believe. When it comes to the material world, do not be like them. The Gentiles, he says, seek. They hunger and they thirst for these things. They hunger and they thirst for food and clothing and mammon and wealth and length of life. That's what unbelievers set their sights on. But the kingdom person who is different puts into opposition to anxiety what Jesus does. Do you know what Jesus puts in opposition to anxiety? Righteousness. Righteousness. Kingdom people have a new affection. They have new hungers, new thirsts. I think that as we go through this portion of scripture. I want to come back. Now I'm, I'm going to wrap it up now. I want to come back. Because we, we, we can go through these five arguments and we go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Ooh, that one makes sense, but I don't act like it makes sense. That one makes sense. This one makes sense. Okay, that's good. I see what this is all about. But what do I do 
if I'm like you, Jamie, I'm an anxious person. I'm a double-minded man. I find myself totally divided, not focused on the right thing. What do I do? I, I hear Jesus say, oh, you of little faith, and go, yep, that's me. Am I just toast? Am I just done? Well, the answer is no. So I want to spend next week, I want to come back to this, and I want to look at this where Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I want to answer the question, what does it look like for us to seek? What does it look like for us with so little faith to fight for faith in the face of anxiety? I'm going to invite the music team to come up now as we prepare for communion. And I want you to know the one who's making these arguments, the one who's being very clear and exposing our heart and how far we fall short, it's this one, this same Jesus who died on the cross for our anxieties, who died on the cross for our double-mindedness. And if you're a believer this morning, then you believe that he died for you the death that you should die because of your anxieties. And not only did he die on the cross, the death we should die, but he raised again. And when he raised again, he conquered death so that we can live. And when we live, guess what we choose? We choose to serve him and not be anxious. Will you stand with me? I'll pray, and then we will finish our time singing. Father, we are grateful that you have sent your Son, your only Son, that he would die on the cross for us, that he would love us enough to reason with us, to give us a way out of anxiety. We're grateful that you have done everything necessary so that we might be filled with your power and be different in this world. We celebrate your grace in our lives, Father God. And so, Lord, as we sing, we ask that it would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.